using that even to keep time with, but that's my reason for having that. Mark chapter number five, Brother Steinecke, um, what happened to you? You backslid four rows. Okay, just let your conscience be your guide. He's one of the guys you see as soon as you come walking in the side door and greeting you. And But God bless him, he's still here after all these years, so we're glad to have you here. Last week we were in the process of talking about some little ships, watching the big ship, and uh, we talked a little bit about the devil-possessed man that was there, and I told you I had somewhere I wanted to go, and I'm going to go ahead and go there this uh, morning. I want to talk about this woman that's here, but I want to draw a couple of things to your attention that maybe you've seen before, and, and if not, take a nap, and then when you wake up, just join in wherever you can. Look in verse number 21. The Bible said, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, which reminds me to say He went out of His way to help a devil-possessed man. Do you ever think about that, that the Lord went out of His way to make sure that you got the gospel? Do you ever realize how fortunate you are that He went out of His way to come by your way? I mean, I realize that the Lord came, I, I get that, but sometimes don't we kind of take that for granted just a little bit, that we think the Lord should have come by my way? Well, what if He didn't come by your way? Did you ever thank God for the fact that you weren't raised in a country with a towel on your head and a rug facing Mecca? Do you ever think where you might be if you were? And you say, well, you know, preacher, I just don't know that I'd ever be that way. If you were raised that way culturally, yes. you happen to be raised in this country in spite of the things that may be wrong with it, where you got a chance to get the gospel and you're sitting in a church on a Sunday morning, you got an opportunity to get something not everybody gets a hold of. So you ought to be grateful for that. And you have Memorial Day coming up tomorrow. I was going to preach on God's memorial today because I think that would be a good time for you to remember Mary. You know, Mary, she was just a good woman, and what did she do? What she could. Yeah. Enough so the Lord made a memorial unto her. But you have a bunch of men and women that fought to give you the right to do what you're doing right now. And holding back the battlements of hell to give you an opportunity to be able to protect you so you still have the freedom to worship the God that saved you. All right, notice what he says here. By ship to the other side, and many people gathered, or excuse me, much people gathered unto him, was nigh unto the sea, and behold, one there cometh one, the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, was nothing better, but rather grew worse. She heard that Jesus came in the press behind, heard of Jesus and came in the press behind and touched his garment. She said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Brother Larry, pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us out. Father Lord, we're grateful to be here. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in church. The Lord's being open. And our brother said, we're grateful to this country still that we're able to Worship Amen. Thank you, that, Lord. thank you, Lord, for what you're doing for us in these days. Thank you for your help. And we do thank you for this building and place to work. Yep. Worship, Lord, and give you the glory for that. And we're reminded, Lord, of who you are in our lives, even this morning, this very moment. Thank you for able to hear, Lord, and that our preacher has been teaching us and showing us and preaching to us about that of a sound mind. God, help us to settle just a little bit this morning to put things uh, to the side. Just for a while, God, that we might hear the word preached. Lord, we ask and remember what the psalmist said, Lord, as far as you being our rock and our, our fortress and our deliverer, and then you said our strength. Lord, we need strength this morning. Man. I pray for strength for our pastor, our preacher. Man. I pray, God, that we lift him up before you, Lord, through these matters. <laughs> God, that you might hold him upright, God. Your might, your power might be upon him. Yeah. Help him to preach to us, Lord. Yeah. Help him to give us the Word of God, and as well for Him, Lord, the intestinal fortitude, the pure guts, Lord, to preach the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Help Amen. Him to not be offended by faces uh, or anything else, Lord, that the Word might come forth and have Him free course. Give Him the liberty to preach. Yeah. Give Him the strength to preach in Jesus yeah. Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Thanks for being kind enough to stand. I was 
thinking how oftentimes we talk about us ourselves being in storms. I had this thought this morning. The title of the sermon could be From One Storm to the Other. And the reason is, is because in this particular passage here, you see the Lord who's in a storm with the ships, and then the Lord is calming someone else's storm by the demon-possessed man, let alone the conflict that is there. And then he's in a storm because of Jairus' daughter, and then he's in a storm because of the woman who has an issue. In other words, we may have individual storms, but every storm we're in, he's in the midst of every one of them. I mean, if anybody had a whole life to speak of, of being in storms, it would be the Lord. Every storm you and I are in, He's in the midst of that storm. I mean, if anybody could preach on storms, the Lord could preach on storms. You say, why? He's been in a few storms for mine. He's been in a few storms for you. And guess what? He's going to be in a few more storms until the Lord blows the horn and we get out of here. I'm grateful for a Lord that's not a fair weather storm rider. I, I'm, I'm grateful for a storm chaser. I'm grateful for a, a Lord that looks for storms to get into to try to do something. He's not always looking for a sunny beach in Miami or out in Vegas somewhere or some other uh, uh, place that would be a, a bad place to be. I'm grateful for a Lord that's always looking for dark clouds. Yeah. He's always looking for difficulty, always looking for trouble, always looking for the crippled and the needy and the people that have uh, particular things that other people don't want to pay any attention to. I like a God like that. I like a God who likes me in spite of the filth I might be in and the trash and the dirt I might be in and the sickness, whatever it might be. I like a God who's not afraid to be in the hospital with puke on the floor and people with urine on them and feces on them. And I like him. I see him working in the doctors. I see him working in the nurses. I see him working with the guy in there with the mop and cleaning up the mess that the people threw up all over the floor and all that. You say, what do you see in that? I see God in all of that stuff trying to take care of people. I'm glad I have a God like that. I'm glad I have a friend that's not just a fair weather friend. I've had some friends before, a few of them, and those friends are individuals. They always seem to be around when things are going good. But boy, if things turn south, and all of a sudden things can change. Jesus has never left me that way. Can I say this about my text that I'm going to talk to you about a little bit this morning? Can I say first and foremost that you need to recognize that the storm that they were in had a purpose, and the purpose wasn't just to set the example for the little ships. It was to take Jesus to a place they would not have otherwise gone and blew Him completely off course of where His intention is intending to go and took Him out of the way for what? One devil-possessed man. You know, I've learned this about God. He'll always go out of His way for you. He's a backup that will always be there for you. All you got to do is say, I need thee, I need thee every hour. And guess what will happen? He'll show up. He'll come up with the blue lights turning and the sirens blaring. And he'll come out. He won't question you. Why would you get in it? How would you get in it? Whose side are you on? He'll jump right in the midst of all those kind of things and help you out of the mess. He's the one that will send Ebed Melech with a rope down there and send it down there to you while you're drowning up to your nose in sewer. He'll send down there and put you some old rags and cast clouts under your arms and take you up, hose you off, give you something to eat and put a fire back inside you. That's the kind of Jesus that we serve. He's the kind of Jesus that's always there. He'll show up in the fiery furnace. He'll show up in the lion's den. And whenever God has to have you there, I think he was there to catch Paul's head when he got chopped off. So you're pretty sure I don't know that. Well, okay, I just think he was saying, don't worry, Paul, I'm right here. And that head came off and took that head and laid it down in that basket. He said, come on, I got a better one for you up top. And Paul got up there in heaven this time and he said, man, I thought I lost my head last time I was up there. This time I saw my head in the basket, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. But where I'm at now is a whole lot better than where I just was. The Apostle Paul knows what it's like to have Jesus come to him when he's over there in the prison cell. In Acts chapter number 16, him and Silas get the fire beat out of them, get the flesh beaten off their back. And Paul's saying, Ben, Silas, ain't this a blessing to be in the perfect will of God? Ain't it a blessing to be over here preaching for Jesus? Ain't it a blessing uh, to be in the darkest part of the dungeon back here? We can finally get a little peace and quiet. My goodness, man, wouldn't it be great? I mean, you know, if his eyes on the sparrow, you know he watches me. Let's sing the doxology, Silas. I mean, and Silas has got to be thinking to Paul, you got to be kidding me, man. I said, no, man, you haven't met him yet. He's always been there in my darkest time. God never leave you and never forsake you. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that whenever you're going through difficulty and trouble, trials, tribulation, persecution, and problems, even some of those by your own making, God still will be there with you. 
I remember that boy a bajillion years ago that shot the little Vietnamese fellow there on Phillips Highway. And I remember after they got through with the interviews and stuff, I went to talk with him briefly and had a good testimony of getting saved when he was at youth camp. You know Christians sometimes get out of whack too. Did you know that? Uh, Christians mess up. You say, I'm going to believe be a Christian and commit murder. Well, he did. I believe the boy was saved. He just got messed up, got strung out on dope, and the next thing he went in, he thought he would go to a stop and rob, and he went in there and shot that fellow, and after everything was over and done with, and we prayed there together and so on and so forth, and uh, I, I told him, I said, okay, well, now, if you meant the prayer, the Lord forgave you, and uh, you're not, you didn't lose your salvation, you're out of fellowship with him, and he said, tearfully, can I please go home now? And I said, yeah, you're going to have to go to your new home. And he said, well, well what does that mean? And I said, you're going to be in Rayford for the rest of your life. You have to still pay for what you did. But I said, hold on just a minute. He started to sob. And I said, now hang on just a minute. Before you get that way, you deserve to go there. And you know you deserve to go there. And I appreciate you being honest about what happened and all that. But you need to know this, that in spite of the fact that you committed a murder in the midst of a robbery, Jesus Christ will still walk with you right through those prison doors and he'll be with you while you're in there and he can use you while you're in there because he promised to never leave you and never forsake you. He said, even after what I did, I said, even after what you did. And I used a couple of illustrations. I said, the Lord's not going to leave you in spite of what you did. Doesn't mean you don't have to pay for it. Far as I know, I haven't looked him up in years and years. He's probably still sitting down there. And he deserves to be, do you understand? But you need to recognize something about your Savior. Even in make mistakes you make and even in sin that you commit, the Lord Jesus Christ puts your sin as far as the east is from the west. He puts them behind his back. He remembers them no more. And he'll restore your fellowship with him today even though you mess up. Mess up, fess up, get up, and then move on. Realize you may have to pay a price for that. That's only the just thing to do. That's the right thing to do. But ladies and gentlemen, one mistake doesn't cause you to be an outcast. And this woman in our story here, he is now all of a sudden had to go out of his way again. He's back in a ship, traveling back over to where he was intended to go when the storm blew him off course. You ever read the story about the Apostle Paul when they loose over there and they wind up over on the island of Melita? That wasn't intended for them to go that way. They wind up shipwrecked over there. You say, why? Some people over there needed Jesus. Do you know sometimes the Lord will blow you off your natural course for a reason, something greater than you? You know that sometimes God will use you in a way you never even dreamed possible. You'll find yourself in a situation that you never thought possible. I don't know why it is that the Lord's let some of you go through some of the things you're going through, but I've been a Christian long enough to know this. Sometimes God has allowed things to occur in your life, storms, shall we say, sicknesses and problems in your life, because He has a way of getting you where you need to go because somebody needs help wherever it is you're going. I don't know why you wind up in emergency rooms. I don't know why you wind up in, in situations where family gets messed up and wind up in hospital rooms or in morgues and those kind of things. I know this, God has a way of using you wherever you are. And sometimes He'll take you places that you wouldn't nor, uh, normally or otherwise go. Well, they hop in the ship there, and of course, as soon as they get off the ship, now the word's beginning to travel, and, and they're beginning to spread the word out there about the great miracles that are done, and no doubt they've gotten upset about the 2,000 pigs that went off the cliff over there and committed suicide and that kind of thing, and the deviled ham is gone, and all the jokes that we tell about that. And when he gets over there, the ruler of the, of the synagogue shows up there, Jarius by name. Now, for an individual like that, it just reminds me to say this, I'm not going to spend long here, but for Jarius to go up and recognize him as one that can heal, he is in effect recognizing him as the Messiah. Yeah. That goes against everything that all of the tradition had been teaching. All the Jewish teaching was that he was an imposter. They were fixing to put him up for being blasphemous because he was calling himself the Son of God. And when he comes up, you say, why? That reminds me to say, sometimes when your little kids get in some serious trouble, it can jam spiritual smelling salts up your nose and make you realize, I don't really care about religion. I need a relationship. I need Jesus. And if Jesus can help me, I don't care if everybody else gets hair-lipped about it. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. I wish I had some Christians nowadays that were willing to do more of what God wanted them to do instead of what the world says to do. Instead of running a popularity contest, they'd be willing to, you know what, I need to have Jesus in my life. You never know when you might need Him. That's not the time to try to get back in touch with Him after you're all of a sudden in a bad situation. 
And he comes up there to him and he bows down to him. In a sense, that's called worshiping him and admitting that he's the authority. And he bows down there at his knees or at his feet. And he says, my little daughter is uh, deathly ill. She's sick. She's 12 years old and, and uh, she's uh, been sick now for about 12 days. And she's nigh on to death. Would you do something for her? And Jesus said, uh, well, I don't know. You hadn't been living right. You hadn't been doing right. And I don't believe in intercessory prayer. And I don't know who you are to think you are to call upon me. And I'm really busy. I got a busy schedule. I'm off schedule. That storm blew me off. Don't you hear about what I did with the devil-possessed man over there and, and that kind of thing? No. You know what Jesus said? Sure, I'll be glad to go see her. You never realize how much your prayer makes a difference. You never realize when you pray and intercede for somebody else how many times God stops what He's doing to listen to what you're saying on the behalf of somebody else. Don't you tell me your prayers don't matter. Don't you tell me, it may not be a miracle, the widow of Nain's son may not rise up out of the dead. Don't you tell me that people can't feel prayers and can't tell when you're praying. I'm telling you right now, I can personally attest to it. My own testimony is, I can feel strength come to me when people are praying for me. I can see God doing things that I know is supernatural and being done. I can tell that. I've been in close fellowship with the Lord enough to know when people are praying. People say, oh, my prayers don't really matter. They just hit a brass ceiling. Don't be so sure about that. Your prayers on the behalf of somebody else are some of the sweetest prayers you can ever pray. I mean, we're taught nowadays to pray for yourself and ask this and ask that, and God grant me prosperity and all those other kind of things. You know the kind of prayer the Lord tends to bow down? Hush up, Michael. Hush up, Gabriel. Y'all hold the noise down there, cherubim. Seraphim, stop flapping your wings, man. Be quiet just a minute. There's somebody down there playing the part that I play, ever living and making intercession for another. There's somebody down there praying on the behalf of somebody else. There's somebody down there that cares about somebody more than they care about themselves. Y'all hush up a minute. I want to hear what they got to say. Sure, I'll go with you. No problem at all. Man, do you realize how that must have hair-lipped the devil? Can I just tell you something? If you don't get anything else out of what I say this morning, could you please get this? Your prayers matter. They make a difference. I know you feel like you're talking to the air. I know you feel like you're talking to your windshield. I know you feel like it ain't getting above the headliner in your car. I'm telling you, when you pray on the behalf of somebody else, I'm telling you it makes a big difference. Them knowing that you're praying for them makes a big difference. It changes things. Well, preacher, you know, I'm not so sure about it. Why do you find yourself in that position and you have to find out about it? You find yourself in that situation and all of a sudden you'd be surprised how quickly things turn around. And you think, well, how did that turn around? Somebody's praying. I can remember Mama Utley praying one time. We were going through a bad situation. I'll not spend too long here, but it was a bad situation. She waited at about 7.30 to call. And we're usually up pretty early and I answered the phone and she said, are you all right? And I said, uh, yes, ma'am, we're doing fine. We're doing just right. She said, are you sure? And I said, yes, ma'am. She says, you ain't lying, are you? And I said, well, no, ma'am. She said, well, that's funny. And I said, why is that funny? She said, well, Lord woke me up about 4.30 this morning. She says, I went up on the mountain and prayed for you and drained Lynn. Man, my heart broke, man. And I was like, because we were going through a terrible, but we were just, you know, we're Southerners. We kind of keep it to ourselves. We don't tell nobody, you know, y'all need prayer. No, we good. You know, you know how that is, right? And uh, I said, no, no, we're, we're fine. We're doing, we're, we're doing fine. And I said, well, yes, ma'am, as a matter of fact. Thanks. She said, I know that was right. I, I knew the Lord wouldn't have woke me up to pray. You say, what happened? Oh, I don't know. By about noon that day, the dark clouds lifted. The sun began to come out and began to dance out there. And all of a sudden, we began to see our way clear to get through the thing that we thought was the end of the world. And all of a sudden, things weren't quite what they ought to be. You say, wow, somebody prayed. Yes. Uh, listen, ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, you know what? You may know the Bible from end to end, from Revelation to, to, to Genesis and backwards and forwards and sideways. But if you know the Lord, you've got something that other people don't have. You have the ability to intercede on behalf of other people. Yeah. Men, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you prayed for your wife? I mean prayed for, not prayed at her, not preached through your prayer. And God, please help her to keep her mouth shut. And God, please help her to clean the house. And God, please help her not to burn the sausage anymore. And God, please, no more of them eggs. Lord, God, please, no more of them eggs. And Lord, not that, not that. Lord, could you please let her just put a little paint on the barn before I come home from work, please? Uh, is that just too much to ask, Lord? I mean, you know, just a little bondo in the cracks. You know, I just, 
you know, no, 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 not, not, not that. Uh, when's the last time you, you prayed that God would bless her and God would help her and Amen. God would help her to carry that burden? Amen. Was the last time she heard you praying for her? Sure. Saying, God, watch over her and care for her. When's the last time your kids felt your hand upon their head and just say, Lord, bless my boy, bless my little girl, bless my grandson, bless my granddaughter. God, help them to grow up and do something and help them out. When's the last time they heard you call on a power higher than yourself? Yeah. Ladies, you want to be a real blessing to your husband? There's nothing like hearing a good woman pray for a man. I know we don't do that stuff publicly and all that stuff. I get all that. I understand that. But boys, you talk about having the Lord bless you. You listen to that woman get a hold of the horns of the altar and go to praying for you. Man, it'll knock your socks off. Amen. There's something about that that the Lord just says, y'all hush up a minute. I got a good woman here praying for a man. Yes. Ma'am, you got a lot of power. Now, I'm not talking about preaching at him through your prayer, ma'am. Well, this mean old ogre needs to learn to hang up his clothes when he comes in and tell him to put him in the dirty clothes hamper and tell him for once would he please fix the leaking roof and take the garbage out without me telling him. And Lord, you know I didn't come here to raise him and to be his mama and pray God that you... Not that, not that, sister, not that. Lord, bless my husband and watch over him and thank you for him. In all things, give thanks. I bet the divorce rate will come down. You say what? Uh, on the behalf of daddy, yeah. this little girl got the help she needed. Yep. You say, yeah, but she died. Yeah, but hold on. Jesus was on the way when she died and it was done for God's glory and she comes back to life again. But that's not where I'm going this morning. I'm going to a woman that's sitting over here who spent everything she had and been to see every doctor and she's no better but worse. I'm going to a woman over there who has a private disease, who has something going on on the inside. Can I say this to you as kindly as I know how to say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? A lot of times what you don't realize is, is that people have inside problems that you can't see like the devil-possessed man and like the dead girl. And there's things you can't see that are going on in their life and you have no idea what's happening to them because inside problems can cause you to bleed to death just as much as outside problems can. There's a lot of people sitting here right now and I wouldn't divulge them to you for anything in the world, but they got some serious problems and you'd never know it if you were to talk to them, if you were to listen to them. They'd never divulge those kinds of things. You say what? Uh, the Bible will teach you that those individuals have those problems on the inside. They're messed up on the inside, but look at them on the outside. Boy, it looks like their marriage is perfect. It looks like their family is perfect. It looks like everything's going wonderful and their bills are paid. It looks like everything is skyrocketing and they're just on the edge. I mean, teeter-tottering on saying, boy, I'm done with this whole thing. I'm finished with this whole thing. I'm through. And the next thing you know, something tragic happens and you're thinking, well, how in the world did that happen? You're hemorrhaging on the inside. Your heart's broken. You're torn out of the frame over something that happened and it's difficult to get help for. It's private. It's not public. The devil possessed man, everybody knows about him. Who wouldn't know about a crazy man running around naked, cutting himself and screaming and hollering, acting the fool out in the graveyard? Everybody knows about that. Isn't it interesting that right between that story and the story about the dead girl is a woman who nobody knows anything about. She's got a private problem. It's not anything public. She's in her house, confined over there, and nobody knows. Do you realize how many people are within the sound of my voice? If you were to throw the doors open and run a speaker out there in this neighborhood right here who were sitting at their house scared to death to come out, afraid to come out, afraid to do anything because they got a private problem they don't think anybody can help them with? Secretive stuff. It's intentional that it's a female problem. Those are the kind of problems you don't discuss publicly. You don't bring those kinds of things out. Not just because it's a purity issue, it's a woman thing. It's not being discreet to bring that out in front of everybody. There's just certain things you just don't discuss. That's why the Bible put it in there. Hey, there's things that happen in people's lives that are not everybody's business. I don't care what Facebook tells you. You have to be careful about putting people's business on the street. Modern society nowadays teaches that your business is my business. That's not true. There's oftentimes things that happen that can be physical problems and people may have those, but they're very personal in nature. They're things that not everybody needs to know about. And if you're entrusted with that, can I just encourage you to pause, ponder, think, consider, realize if they trusted you with that, they trusted you because they wanted to talk to you, but they didn't want you to talk to everybody. 
The greatest friend you have in a time like that is Jesus. I don't know who it was. She must have had a friend. The Bible said she heard. Somebody must have been talking to her in spite of the fact that it looks like we'll just use her as a Christian that's out of fellowship. Nobody can see her. Nobody can talk to her if the Bible's right and the Levitical law is correct. Nobody could come see her. Nobody could touch her. Nobody could visit her. Everywhere she went would be considered impure. Every person that she touched or was around would be considered impure. They would have to go through the process of cleansing and those kind of things. She's literally having the life's blood drained out of her. She is anemic and she is unable to do things for herself. But somebody, in spite of being connected with who and what, she was because the Bible doesn't give you a name she is known by her malady she's known by her disease she's known by her sickness she's known by the thing that makes her different than everybody else could I say this she's labeled aren't we quick to Label people. And aren't we quick to especially label the unclean and the impure? Aren't we so quick to snap to judgment people that are not like us or who may have made some bad choices along the way? And sometimes those people actually show up at the hospital, we'll use that like the church, and they need some help. But man, I mean, you can tell that time with iron-shod hooves has stomped sin all over their face and oftentimes painted their body and given them holes and piercings and clothing and haircuts and hemlines that are all entirely different than us people. Enough to make you uncomfortable in their presence. Enough to make you feel like, no, I don't know that I want to be around that. Listen, I'm not saying to not be aware. I'm simply saying that when the Lord made a decision to die on the cross, He actually died for those people too. And I want you to at least pause for you good folks in here to understand that but by the grace of God, you wouldn't have been a good folk. And just because you're sitting here today, it's not because you haven't had issues in the past. And it's not because you hadn't been bleeding to death and whether or not the world has bled you out, the flesh has bled you out, or the devil has bled you out, and you had one step between you and death, and God stepped in in spite of who you are and how He knows you to be, whether you see yourself that way or not. I think sometimes it would be good for many of us to recognize where would I be if it hadn't been for God. I I remember there's a, a, a guy named uh, Miniger was a uh, psychiatrist a bajillion years ago. The old preacher saw him a few times, and one of the things he said was, he said, when you really think you have a problem, you need to go down and sit at the emergency room and see people that have real problems. But one of the things that he also said was, is that, but by God's grace, none of us, can prevent ourselves from the fallen state in which we were born. That's a pretty profound statement. If you pause and think about it for just a minute, that's not even psychological in nature. It has a tendency to get this idea. We get kind of uppity. Our mindset is, is that we kind of think, well, that would never happen to me because I'm just such a good person. You do realize that the Pharisees are the ones that wind up not getting any help. As a matter of fact, the Lord says the prostitutes wind up going into the gates before those people. And they were good religious people. They did everything according to the rules and everything according to the law. But can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? None of those individuals... Remember when the Pharisee and the prostitute were there? And the prostitute came in there to worship the Lord and she began to weep and cry and wipe his feet with her hair. And the Pharisee said, boy, if he knew what kind of woman that was touching him. And I've always said to you, not jokingly, how is it that he knows about that woman what he knows about that woman? But doesn't it make you pause to ponder? Doesn't it make you think about the individuals that the Lord is saying to you, maybe even this morning, hey, guess what? You have a problem and you're dirty and you're filthy and you're bleeding to death and nobody knows about it. God knows about it. 
Because oftentimes those things on the inside, no matter how great your curb appeal is, you're still bleeding to death. We had a fellow down on 8th Street one night, actually 7th Street, uh, over there, 7th and uh, Laura Street right there. And uh, when we got there, he's laying on the sidewalk and he, he couldn't walk around and all that. And I said, hey man, what's going on? I thought he was intoxicated. And I said, hey man, what's going on with you? And he said, a bee bit me. And I said, a bee bit you? And he said, a bee bit me. Bee bit me right here, boss. Bee bit me right here. And I said, what do you mean a bee bit you? He said, a bee. I said, it's midnight. There ain't no bees flying around at midnight. What do you mean a bee bit you? He said, a bee bit me. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, me and this guy, we kind of got into this and that and the other and so on and so forth. And he said, the next thing I know, he said, I felt like a bee bit me right here. Well, rescue got there and all that kind of stuff, and they checked. Now, the tiny, I mean smaller than a pinky, there's a little old bitty, you couldn't hardly tell, it looked like maybe a needle stuck him in there. And they took him in there, and so I got finished with all the stuff you have to do, and I took off over there to uh, 8th, 8th Street, uh, the hospital there, old University of 8th and Davis, or 8th and uh, whatever it is, it's there. And I went to the hospital, pulled in the emergency room, and I said, hey, the guy that got in here, he kept saying a bee bit him, a bee bit him, and he said, oh yeah, he's gone. I said, what? I said, rescue showed me. He's got a little spot just in, the, in his hind end, just a, I mean, tiny little hole right there. He said, yeah, he said, that little thing was a little 25-year uh, automatic. He said, it went through, and it clipped his femoral artery. And by the time he got here, I said, there wasn't even any blood there. And he said, no, it was all inside. And in a matter of about 30 minutes, they got him in there. There was nothing they could do. You say, why? A bee bit him. Just a little small thing, and he hemorrhaged to death. Oh, preacher, you're just telling one of them shocking stories again. No, I'm telling you what happened. Absent from the body, and who knows where he wound up being. Do you ever pause to think about that, ladies and gentlemen, that some of you are sitting here this morning, and you know what? The bee bit you, and you're bleeding. But boy, you got good curb appeal. You got it all together. You don't need to go to an altar. Somebody might see, you know, that you, uh, you know, something's not right with you or whatever. You know, your tie might be crooked or whatever. You don't have everything the way it's supposed to be because you got everybody fooled that everything's going great. But on the inside, you're bleeding to death. Bitterness, bitterness has cut you from the inside out, boy, and you are bleeding to death right now, sure as I'm standing here. And the Lord coming by and saying, hey, what are you doing? Well, I've seen everybody and I've read every book and I've read every motivational book and I've read every and heard every sermon. I got every CD and I've got this and all that. And I'm just, I, this is just what I think and how I feel about it. And you're still bleeding. You know what you have? No energy. You know what happened with this woman? Somebody told her, <clears throat> I'm sorry you've been to see all these doctors and I'm sorry they weren't able to do any good for you and I'm sorry you spent everything and there's a physician that's come into town. She said, well, I don't have any money. Good, he doesn't require money. Amen. Now, a Southerner, if she's a Southern woman, you know what she'd said? I don't take no charity. Hmm. Right? I don't take no charity. I figure out some kind of way to pay him. No, he ain't interested in payment. All you got to do is get to him. I'll tell you right now, he's a great physician. I've seen him do a lot of things. Really, what have you seen him do? I saw him give a blind man his sight. I saw him give a deaf man his hearing. I saw him give a dumb man his ability to be able to talk. Man, you should have seen him, man. I saw him get a guy up out of a coffin and get him up there walking again. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Why don't, why don't you just why don't you come see him? If you can get to him, I can guarantee you he can do something for you. You know what she had to be willing to do even in her weakened condition? She had to admit she had the condition, but she had to be willing to do something about it. But can I say this to you? She is wore out with trying to do something about it. Tell me we haven't all been there before. I've had enough. I've done everything I know to do. I don't have another try in me. I don't know if you've ever been there before. It's like, why bother? Every time I go, this happens. Every time I've been there, this happens. Every time. And the Lord says, how about just one more time? I bet she's glad she got up. Somebody came by. I don't know if they put a track on the door. I don't know what they did. I don't know how they got word to her. Uh, maybe they sent some kind of a message to her. Maybe it was a, <coughs> excuse me, an instant message or something like that. I don't know. But the Bible said she heard. Somebody told her. There's a great physician coming in town. And she said, you know something? If everything they say about that man is true, if I could get to him and I could just touch his garment, 
meaning I would recognize he is the Messiah. If I could just touch his clothes, I can guarantee you I'd be made whole. I'm going to give it one more try, and if not, I'm going to die trying. Boy, I appreciate her guts. I appreciate her character. You say, why? In those days, ladies and gentlemen, for a woman that was that unclean and that impure and everybody in town knows her by her disease and by her frailties and by her sickness and by the filth and all that, everybody would be pointing fingers at her and she has and they have the right to stone her if they catch her out because she defiles every place she goes. You ever think about that? how difficult it was for her to go into a situation like that and realize she's exposing herself publicly. You know, one of the things that I hate about church sometimes, I hate to say this, is that sometimes we're real good about bringing up people's past. We're real good about recognizing people for their maladies. We're real good about recognizing them for their unfaithfulness and their uncertainty and for the mistakes they've made in the past. Yep, they're still here. They're still trying. They're still making an effort. I mean, it's harder for those that have messed up and fessed up than it is for those that don't know about the mess up. It's hard for them. You say, why? Because between the Lord who has an answer for her problem and for the physical and psychological issues she has, there's a whole bunch of people in between. She's just trying to get to Jesus. I don't want to be one of those people. I quote Psalms chapter number one a different way. Blessed a man who walked not in the way of the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of God, nor standeth in the way of sinners. I, I quote that a little differently when I say standeth in the way of sinner. That means I prevent somebody from getting to Jesus because of the way I live and what I do. I don't want to be one of those people that derails somebody with my liberty and derails somebody with my mouth and derails somebody with my wicked living or with my decisions about certain things or them hearing me talk about people all the time. I don't want to be one of those that stands in the way of sinners getting to Jesus. You say, what? Well, they just need help. I'm not really selective about that. I don't figure the Lord was too selective when he selected me. I don't believe Calvin's foolishness. I believe I messed up the eternal decree when he said, you're going to hell. And I said, no, I ain't. I ain't going to hell. I'm getting saved. Amen. You say, what happened? That was his eternal degree, and I decided to mess up the whole thing. If you're lost today, you can mess up an eternal degree. You say, how do you do that? You tell him, I, you said, I'm going to hell. I ain't going to hell. Amen. I'm getting saved. David goes over there to Kalil and they say, hey, they're coming down. David says, are they going to get me, Lord? And the Lord said, yep, they're going to get you. Sure as I'm sitting here, are they going to turn me over? Yep, they're going to turn you over. They never did. Well, then God lied. No, David got up and got out. You know how you can get out of hell right now? You can come to Jesus Christ and get saved and mess up the eternal decree. Without Jesus Christ, you know where you're going? You're going to wind up in hell. If you don't want to go to hell, you mess that thing up. You say, what? Lord, would you save me? That's how, it's that, it's that simple. I know I'm a sinner. I admit I'm a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess you as Savior. Well, what happens to her is she's got a lot of things to overcome. That's in between her ears. You know what? I'm positive that in her mind that she thought the reception of the people was going to be a lot worse than it really was. I'm positive that she thought it was going to be a lot worse than it really was. You know, the devil will have a tendency to put everything under a magnifying glass. Yes. Yes. And if I go back after what I did, you know how they're going to act, you know what they're going to do, you know what they're going to say, right? But guess what? The people were in the way, but nobody was directly offensive to her. They just, she just couldn't get there because there were so many people there. And sometimes when you try to get back to the Lord, you know what will happen? Then What's between your ears or getting away? You know, well, if I go there, what about the hypocrites in the church? What about the deacon stealing money out of the plate? What about the preacher that ran off with the piano player or the secretary? What about, you know, grandma's grave being moved? What about, you know, that? you say, what if that's all in your head? You get desperate enough, you know what? You don't care. You know what that old girl did? She sat there in that rocker long enough and she rocked back and forth enough times and finally eventually like jumping out of a swing on a swing set on a playground, she eventually got to the point where she started swinging and the next she got enough energy and she jumped up out of that chair, just about fell over on her face and she grabbed her shawl, put on her hoodie and out the door she went and she stepped outside in that thing and she's expecting any minute it's going to be hard. You know I've seen people come to the edge of an alt and the edge of an aisle before and stop right at the edge of an aisle. You say, what? It's real, isn't it? Amen. There's something keeping you right now. Some of you are thinking, I should maybe go here. I don't know about that. It's just, yeah, but when you get desperate, you don't care about all the people. 
All those people are down there. You know what she's doing? She's thinking about the people. Listen, don't think about the people before you think about him. You need the great position. You better get to the great position. You say, why? He ain't going to be there long. Time for you to move on. She gets up that day and she steps down those back stairs and goes down the pathway there. Hadn't been there since she was a little girl, man. And down through that pathway she goes and she looks a couple of blocks over and she's watching the throng of people going by and she's trying to figure out an intersecting path and how can I get over there and how do I get to him? And she's over there thinking, man, what's going to happen? What do you think she's thinking? Have you ever think about that? What do you think she's thinking? Do you think her first thought is that I just get to him, I'll be fine? Or do you think she might be thinking, man, I wonder what Miss Smith's going to say. I wonder what they're going to post about me on Facebook. I wonder who's going to send a text. I wonder who's going to send an email. I wonder how quick they're going to call about me coming down the altar that day. I, I wonder how quick, I wonder how many people hesitate getting to the Savior because they're worried about the peeps between them and the Savior. And what they think the people are going to say. But if you get desperate enough, you know what you'll do? You don't care what the people think. You say, why? You're sick. You're hemorrhaging. If you don't get help, you're going to bleed to death. And that's male and female. The Lord's just using it to let you know in this particular case, oftentimes the Lord picks on women because they're strong enough to take it. Men get their behind on their shoulders and walk out and never come back around again. Women take a licking and keep on ticking. That's why she's still married to you, boy. <coughs> All you boys. Sorry. Is that, a, is that a can't? And a hush fell. <laughs> this old girl, you know what she said? I, I really don't care what all the doctors told me. There's no hope. All the physicians and all the money I've spent if I can get to him. That cry of desperation, you say, why? She's tired of hemorrhaging. She's tired of being weak. She's tired of fighting. Do you ever have a besetting sin? You're hemorrhaging. You're bleeding. You sweat, drains your energy. Right when you get your feet under, you start doing pretty good. That thing hits you again, and it's like, man, what is going on? The Lord said, you're bleeding to death. I need to cauterize that wound. I need to wash you out and cleanse you. I need to fix that thing so that I can then put the right amount of energy so that it'll wind up staying. Every time I put it in there, it keeps bleeding back out. Why? Because you're not fixing what's wrong with you. And she goes and makes her way. Fortunately, it doesn't appear that anybody even recognizes her. She comes up there in the press, the crowd behind him, and she reaches out there to touch that trembling hand, that emaciated hand, that weakness has now taken her about as far as she can go. And now he's beginning to travel faster and she can't keep up for the crowd and for all the other things going on, maybe at the last moment of weakness. And she stretches out as much as she can and she reaches out to touch and she touches in the other passage the hem of his garment. That's the border around the bottom. That's the closest place to the ground. You say, why? In order to get help, you got to get down. Yes. Amen. If you want to get up, you got to get down. Yes. If you want to get first, you got to be last. Yes. Amen. If you want to be the master, you have to be the servant. Yes. You say, what happened? The Lord stopped. Amen. Amen. All those people that are there in this throng around him after he has done some miraculous things, calmed the storm and healed the devil-possessed man up and cast out the devils and all these great and mighty things around. I mean, the Pavarazzi's following him and all the news agencies are following him. I mean, he has a throng of people around him. But you know what's amazing to me? He is never impressed in crowds. Amen. He went out of his way for the devil-possessed man. He's on his way to help a little girl. He's got all these people around him. He's not impressed with all the people around him. He's just trying to go help somebody else. <coughs> Excuse me, from one storm to another. And then all of a sudden, somebody touches him and the Lord stops. I made a note in my Bible a lot of years ago. Do you have the power to stop the sun? Wow. That's a powerful touch. I'm not talking about sun, S-U-N. I'm talking about sun, S-O-N. Do you have the power? Do you hurt bad enough? Do you have a need deep enough that you could reach out and touch him and the Lord say, Woo, who touched me? 
Woo! Somebody touched me. All the apostles are like, Lord, you know, we've been in Bible school now three years. I mean, you know, I mean, who touched you? you? Lord, look at all these people around here. What do you mean who touched me? Yeah, you've been in Bible school for three years and you still hadn't learned anything. Somebody just touched me that has a need, know they have a need, and know I can meet that need. That's the difference in the touch. Not just people here for a photo op. Not just people that want to say, I saw Jesus when he did. Somebody who needs Jesus to do. Not just brag about, I was there when he, but I was the one who he did it to. Who touched me? I mean, I know the Lord probably didn't go, whoo. But I think in his mind, this is me, that's just Jesus I make up. I think he said, Man, I've been looking for somebody like you for a long time. All these people around me and they don't know what you know. You say, why? It was her disease that made her realize what she really needed. Those people that were around him didn't even know they had a disease. None of them thought they were sick. Do you? They're all healthy. They're all physically well. They're all walking around and doing just fine. Their bellies are full. Their legs are moving, their eyes are seeing, their ears are hearing, their mouths are talking. I mean, as far as looking at them, they don't need anything. The Lord said, whoo, somebody touched me. What does that mean? Somebody touched me. I don't believe just meaning touch me and virtue goes out from him. I mean touch me, touched my heart with their cares. I don't have a great position up there or a mediator or high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of my infirmities. Lord, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. I got a problem. I am bleeding to death. I'm hemorrhaging. I'm going to die if you don't do something. Woo, somebody touched me. Man, man, somebody touched me. You ever think about this? The Lord is just sitting there just wanting to do something for somebody. He's thinking, man, from the boat to Jerry's, surely somebody along the way will say, Lord, could you just for a second, could I interrupt you? I need something. Lord, could you help me? I need something. My family's falling apart. My relationship with my wife's falling apart. My job's falling apart. My health is falling apart. My finances are falling apart. My whole life is falling apart. God, I need something. Could I interrupt you? Ooh, somebody touch me. Somebody, whoo, I mean, I'm talking in his heart of hearts. That's why he's here. That's what he wants to do. He wants you to stop him and say, help me, Jesus. I was fortunate enough early in a little bit of a career I had to ride in (coughs) downtown area, what they used to call the projects. I don't know what they are now, but and I met a bunch of elderly black folks. I wish I could count how many times in a bad situation grandma would be over there. Oh, help me, Jesus. Oh, help me, Jesus. Jesus, help me. Please help me, Jesus. Help me. Oh, preacher, what a silly thing. Uh uh-uh. uh. He said, What's the Lord doing? You say, Y'all hush up. Y'all hush up. There's somebody down there touching me right now. There's somebody touching me with the feelings of their infirmity. There's somebody touching me. There's somebody hurting right now. All you other people are worried about everything else going on. You know what they're doing? I'm trying to comfort that brokenhearted grandma right now. I wish I had learned what I know now then. There's a lot more to touching Jesus than just physically touching him. Being in touch with him. To know that when I come up there that the Lord pauses, leans over the battlements of heaven, sits down off of the throne, gets down off the throne, and kneels right down there beside you and said, I got you. I feel for you. You touched me today. You touched me not. He touched me. And oh, the joy that filled me. Thank you. He saved me. I appreciate that. No, 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 no. I'm talking about when's the last time you touched him? When's the last time you touched him with your infirmity? 
When's the last time that you bled out and said, Lord, I really need you. I am too self-sufficient. I am too full of myself. I'm too arrogant. Lord, I am weak. I am needy. If you don't do something, Lord, I'm not going to make it. Help me, Jesus. I was in her touch. That little old girl reached out and touched the Lord and said, whoo. Who turn around. I love the way the Bible's written. <coughs> the Lord has a way of making innuendos. Because apparently at the moment that that happened, and he turned around, this little old emaciated woman, the Bible said, immediately it was staunched, it was stopped. Immediately she was made whole the second she touched him. So there was a noticeable transformation that happened, and apparently everybody had kind of cleared out. And it looks in my mind like the Lord turned around, and he's looking right at her and said, Who touched me? Like your daddy used to do when he caught you doing something and you couldn't say it was Yehudi. <laughs> You ever done that? There was always me, my sister, my brother, and Yehudi. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. She didn't do it. Must have been Yehudi, right? Nobody there. He's looking right at you. Boy, did you do that? It's like, you know he knows, but you know if you say yes, sir, you're going to get a whooping, but you're going to get one anyway. Boy, he'd say, did you do that? Yes, sir. You know, I always found him to go easier on me if I was up front yep. than if I tried to justify what I did. Mm -hmm. He was good like that. He still whooped me. But it wouldn't be quite as bad. Are you with me? I'm almost done. <coughs> she comes up there and the Lord looks at her. And apparently now, you know how people are, they're like, wasn't me. Wasn't me. I, no, no, I didn't touch you. Wasn't me. See, they think he's accusing somebody of doing something wrong. Not me. I didn't touch you. Oh, no, not me. No, not me. I didn't. No, uh -uh, not. Might have been him. Might have been her. It wasn't me. I didn't put my hands on you. Get the fingerprint dust. Get out the super glue. Put it in the ball and see if we can get, you know, the DNA. No, no, no. I, I didn't touch you. And then they look at her, and they're like, oh, that's that nasty, dirty woman. That's who it is. And the Lord steps in. Now, all this is happening between the passages. Man, preacher, you got a vivid imagination. Oh, man. The Lord shuts them down with one word. You know what it was? It wasn't shut up. You know what it was? He said, daughter. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, he must know her or something. He's calling her by an endearing term. That man just recognized the dirty woman as his daughter. Yeah. That the filthy woman who's known by her disease and by her hemorrhaging and all the things that uh, he just touched. Let somebody that's unclean touch him who's clean. And that's why the Bible says virtue. God's not afraid of your filth. God's not afraid of your dirt. God's not. He'll give you His virtue and clean you up. You're not going to drain Him dry. He will not lose His power to forgive you and wash you in the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not going to make Him dirty by touching Him. Amen. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Daughter. Thy faith and made the whole. As soon as he said, daughter, immediately the fear of he's going to take it away, it leaves. She's like, oh, I'm somebody special to him. Yes, you are. Why? What did I bring to him? My filthy disease. My hemorrhaging. Twelve years of nastiness and being talked about and made fun of and everybody in town knows you. Your reputation is ruined. She brought all that to him. Daughter, isn't it funny how 
as a parent, uh, I hate to say this, and even as a grandparent, it's probably a little worse, how we kind of tend to have a little nepotism when it comes to that. I mean, if anybody else's kid did what your kid did, you'd be like, hang them up, let them dry. We don't care, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Am I right? Yes, sir. But when it's your kid, it's like, well, you know, I mean, they're good kids and they're trying. And I get that break with the Lord sometimes. Yeah, that's my kid. Did you see what he did? Yeah. But he's my kid. Daughter, son. I did something one time. It wasn't real bad. My dad whooped me. And when he got done whooping me, I'll never forget after he got done. It took me a few minutes to gather myself. He came and he sat down and put his arm around me. He hugged me up and he said, boy, you know your daddy loves you, don't you? I thought in my mind, I have a funny way of showing it. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew in my heart. Yeah. See, so he had the right balance. You know what? I never quit being his son even when I messed up. You know what some of you are doing here this morning? You are bleeding to death, and it's a good thing those pews are maroon colored because everybody would be able to tell that you're hemorrhaging to death on the inside even though your curb appeal on the outside looks fine. But stuff going on on the inside can cause outside problems. So what do you need to do? I don't know. What do you think about touching him? Preacher, how do I touch him? He's not here today. Oh, we well, know we he's here. Oh, no, 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 he's here. You just don't see him like she saw him walk by. He's here right now. He had a preacher get up and preach to you today because he wants to say to you, son or daughter, why don't you come touch me with the feelings of your infirmities? Why don't you come tell me about it? Why don't you touch me and let me see what I can do?